Good morning and welcome to the Little Home Church by the Wayside. Today is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost and we send our love to all of those who are watching us online today. Um, you are a part of our church community. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We are an open and affirming church, folks from all walks of life, regardless of race, sexuality, or any other perceived difference, can always find a place at our table. You're important to us. Please fill out a visitor's card if you are visiting with us for the very first time and drop it in the offering uh, basket as it comes by later in the service. Just a few announcements here this morning. Um, Lori's going to be on vacation for the next few weeks. And um, Jen will be filling in a couple days a week for us. And so um, she did want me to mention one thing about today's bulletin. Um, because she, she gets nervous about this. Um, it is co more common today in theologies and things to take the word kingdom and change it into kingdom, okay? When Jesus was speaking, he was um, fighting against a lot of imperial, you know, um, governments and things, and so he did use those words. But today, uh, the thought is that rather than be so imperialistic ourselves with the kingdom, we say kingdom. And it happens, that word happens a lot in our prayers and things today. So it's not a typo, it it's, was planned. I encourage you to pay close attention and be an active listener today to the two scripture readings this morning. Not that you don't always, but just a little boost there. I want to thank Carl for being our pulpit associate. Mike and Mary are our ushers today. The flowers are from Lori and Jen. And fellowship today is provided by Lori and Jen with a little help from me. Um, this coming Wednesday, Bible study, 10 o'clock. You can do it on Zoom or in person in the pastor's office and 7 o'clock choir practice at night. This Thursday, contemplative services start again. So at 8 in the morning and then at 7 o'clock at night. They're 30-minute services, um, a chance to um, meditate on a topic and to uh, do some breath work and some nice uh, quiet music as well. And this week's subject is simply the word harvest. Next Sunday, big day. It's a great day to invite visitors. It's World Communion Sunday. Um, and then after that service, we'll end about 10.15. We will proceed outside. And the weather's looking good right now. It is Blessing of the Hounds Sunday. And fellowship will be outside afterwards. We can use all hands on deck from our church just everybody um, bring a plate of cookies or something like that, and we'll have a nice time of fellowship for everybody um, for Blessing of the Hounds. October 19th is the next third Saturday in the month, and we continue our ongoing um, practice of packing food for the Northern Illinois Food Bank, and we do need volunteers. Last month, I believe Ann McLaughlin was our only person. She, she was flying solo last time. Um, and uh, so it would be great. Uh, we have six slots, so it would be great to get those six slots filled. And we need it sooner than later because we actually have to register you with Northern Illinois Food Bank. And then the very next day on Sunday, October 20th, in the morning, we have our community house kickoff and come that day and find out what that's gonna be all about. And then um, later in the day, we are the church sponsoring Crop Walk once again. And the following uh, Sunday in October, October 27th, we'll have our trunk or treat. There's ways that you can sign up to help. One of the biggest things, last year we had close to 300 or more than 300 people there, is donating bags of candy. For the folks who do trunks and decorate, uh, their reserves sometimes run low, and it's just great to have a stockpile of candy, and we have runners who keep, uh, keep, keep the coffers going there, as it were. Are there any other announcements for today? Clara. And, and Michael, come up here. So, Clara, right over here. 
Hold it real close. I don't think it's on. Can we check, Catherine? Try it again. Girl Scout, oh, there we go. Girl Scout fall product has come. So um, most of you know that Girl Scouts sell cookies, but during the fall, we have um, something different, like um, nuts and pretzels and trail mixes and chocolate. And um, I will be taking orders at Fellowship today if anyone is interested. All right, so Girl Scouts sign up for nuts and chocolates and all kinds of snacks. Andrea. Yes, um, thank you to Jennifer Harmon and Lori because online is going to be a sign-up sheet for the outreach bags again for Naomi's house. They contacted us and they need them. You know, it's getting cold out there. There's a, or it will at least, uh, there's a list of I think 25, I 25, 27 items, 100 each, so you'll be able to sign up, whatever you can do. I would recommend Amazon Costco, because Costco, it already comes in, in bulk um, for most of those items. So take a look for that email, and thanks again, Jennifer and Lori. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a great opportunity. Anybody else? All right. We always start our service then after announcements with a little time of centering. And today I have a prose poem for you. It's from a Minnesota-born uh, poet. His name is Tom Hennon. And he grew up on farms and did a lot with nature. And so he's written um, many poems in this fashion. And today is a playful riff on Psalm 118. This is the day the Lord has made. Like people or dogs, each day is unique and has its own personality, quirks, which can be easily seen if you look closely. But there are so few days as compared to people, not to mention dogs, that it would be surprising if a day were not a hundred times more interesting than most people. But usually, they just pass, mostly unnoticed, unless they are wildly nice, like autumn ones full of red maple trees and hazy sunlight, or if they are grimly awful ones in a wintered blizzard that kills the lost traveler and bunches of cattle. For some reason, we like to see days pass, even though most of us claim we don't want to reach our last one for a long time. We examine each day before us with barely a glance and say, no, this isn't one I've been looking for, and wait in a bored sort of way for the next, when we are convinced our lives will start for real. Meanwhile, this day is going by perfectly well, just as other days do, with the right amounts of sunlight and shade and a light breeze scented with a perfume made from the mixture of fallen apples, corn stubble, dry oak leaves, and the faint odor of last night's meandering skunk. <laughs> May God be with us in this service. May it not be just another service for any of us. Amen. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. Praise God from the heavens, God in the heights. Let the sun and moon beam with pride, God has called us into being. Let the sea monsters and stormy winds howl the wind. God has called us into being. Let the mountains and rivers be satisfied in it. God has called us into being. Let those who are weary dance the good news, and let those whose throats are parched sing it. God is with us. 
Let mighty rulers learn of it from their poorest citizens. God is with us. Let the youngest and eldest prophesy it together. God is with us. Let the song be as high as the shining stars. God is faithful. Let the shout be as thunderous as an earthquake. God is faithful. Let reinsurance be as sweet as a lullaby and hope as a delicious as a daydream. God is faithful. Please join me in the prayer of invocation. Triune God, make us one as you are one. As we enter worship, may our harmony extend beyond our songs. May our distinctiveness be welcomed, our identities be celebrated, and our differences be a source of delight. May your church serve as a beacon for belonging and demonstrate the beloved community of the kingdom in your name this day and all our days. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for transformation and new life. Righteous God, we acknowledge the need for repentance and repair. We have cutesying and common good with controlling our neighbor. We have confused unity with uniformity. We have co-signed on societal norms that divide, segregate, and, and exclude rather than becoming agents of cultural change to bridge, welcome, and belong. Transform our hearts and stir our souls, foster a spirit of curiosity, hospitality, and reconciliation to make things right with our neighbors 
foes, and friends. Lead us on the path of belonging. Amen. Hear these words of grace. We are not bound by the pressures of culture or the attitudes of our past. Our embod embedded biases may be broken, our isolationist tendencies shattered, and our fearful reactions unlearned. We belong to the kingdom, and the kingdom belongs to us. Press forward with the grace to transform and create a world reflecting the realm of God with peace, justice, and righteousness for all. Our first scripture reading, Numbers 11, verses 4 to 6, 10 to 16, and 24 to 29 from the English, from the Common English Bible. Complaint over the lack of meat. The riffraff among them had a strong craving. Even the Israelites cried again and said, who will give us meat to eat? Remember the fish we ate in Egypt for free, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions and the garlic. Now our lives are wasting away. There is nothing but manna in front of us. Moses complained about leadership. Moses heard the people crying throughout their clans, each at his tent's entrance. The Lord was outraged and Moses was upset. Moses said to the Lord, why have you treated your servant so badly? And why haven't I found favor in your eyes? For you have placed the burden of all these people on me. Did I conceive all these people? Did I give birth to them that you would say to me, carry them at the breast? As a nurse carries an unweaned child to the fertile land that you promised your ancestors, where am I to get meat for all these people? They are crying before me and saying, give us meat so we can eat. I can't bear this people on my own. They're too heavy for me. If you're going to treat me like this, please kill me. If I found favor in your eyes, then don't let me endure this wretched situation. The Lord said to Moses, Gather before me 70 men from Israel's elders, whom you know as elders and officers of the people. Take them to the meeting tent and let them stand there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the Lord's words. He assembled 70 men from the people's elders and placed them around the tent. The Lord descended in a cloud, spoke to him, and took some of the spirit that was on him and placed it on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on, on them, they prophesied, but only this once. Two men had remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the second named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those who registered, but they hadn't gone out to the tent, so they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua's nun's son and Moses' assistant since his youth, responded, my master, Moses, stop them. Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? If only the Lord's people were prophets with the Lord placing his spirit on them. And passing of the peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. Be with you. We encourage you to place your hands over your heart as you greet those around you. purple day. I'm seeing lots and lots of purple here. Um, so look what I've got. Have you ever seen anything like that before? What do you think it is? Clara, any ideas? Words. And the language of these words um, 
are not in English but Latin. So, it's a page out of a very famous kind of Bible. And we have an anniversary tomorrow. 572 years ago, in 1452, the first section of the Gutenberg Bible was finished by a man named Johannes Gutenberg. He was um, the youngest son of a very wealthy businessman, and his innovations in developing, um, the, he developed what we call the modern printing press. Now back then they didn't call it that, they called it the art of multiplying books. Back then, people couldn't read because there weren't many books. Do you know how you would have to get a Bible before the printing press? Somebody else would have to write down the Bible, all the Bible, every word. And then you would get um, your copy of the Bible. So people depended on whatever the church authorities and government authorities told them at the time. But once the printing press was invented, and we have these beautiful, beautiful pages, then everybody could read the Bible. And it changed society. It changed the world we lived in, just like computers changed the world that we live in. And so this is a really, really important thing that we can have Bibles in our, our um, pews here at church. We can have Bibles at home. Many of you probably have a children's Bible. And do you remember a couple weeks ago we talked about getting started on memorizing some Bible verses? Well, this is the perfect day to get started on it. Emma and I have a little bit of work to do, but here is your first Bible verse that you're going to memorize, and we'll keep track of it on a chart. And it'll be good for families and things to do too, and we'll, we will have a little reward system. Um, the twins can't be here today, Helena and um, Elise, due to a soccer game, but Helena made a request for cake pops, and maybe you guys have some other special treats that you like, but we'll figure it out. But you're going to have to learn several Bible verses first. So the first one is, be kind and loving to each other. Can you say that with me? Be kind and loving to each other. Forgive each other. Forgive each other just as God forgives you. Just as God forgives you. Let's try it one more time. Be kind and loving to each other. Forgive each other just as God forgives you. Great. And so we're going to start this journey of learning a little bit about memorizing some verses from the Bible. And we owe a great debt of gratitude to somebody like Johannes Gutenberg, who was creative and had a way to figure out how to do the art of multiplying books. All right? Off you go to Sunday school. I'll give these to Emma. In fact, I'll give you that too. I don't Our second scripture reading, Mark chapter 9, verses 38 to 50 from the Common English Bible. Recognize your allies. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone throwing demons out in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. Jesus replied, Don't stop him. No one who does powerful acts in my name can quickly turn around and curse me. Whoever isn't against us is for us. I assure you that whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will certainly be rewarded. 
As for whoever causes these little ones who believe in me to trip and fall into sin, it would be better for them to have a huge stone hung around their necks and to be thrown into the lake. If your hand causes you to fall into sin, chop it off. It's better for you to enter into life crippled than to go away with two hands into the fire of hell, which can't be put out. If your foot causes you to fall into sin, chop it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to be thrown into hell with two feet. If your eyes, eye causes you to fall into sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter God's kingdom with one eye than to be thrown into hell with two. That's a place where worms don't die and the fire never goes out. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? Maintain salt among yourselves and keep peace with each other. For the word in scripture, for the word among us, for the word within us, thanks be to God. Recognize your allies. An old Italian gentleman lived alone in New Jersey. He wanted to plant his annual tomato garden, but it was very difficult work as the ground was hard and he was getting older. His only son, Vincent, who used to help him, was in prison. The old man wrote a letter to his son and described his predicament. Dear Vincent, I am feeling pretty sad because it looks like I won't be able to plant my tomato garden this year. I'm just getting too old to be digging up a garden plot. I know if you were here, my troubles would be over. I know you would be happy to dig the plot for me, like in the old days. Love, Papa. A few days later, he received a letter from his son. Dear Papa, don't dig up that garden. That's where the bodies are buried. <laughs> Love, Vincent. At 4 a.m. the next morning, FBI agents and local police arrived and dug up the entire area without finding any bodies. <laughs> they apologized to the old man and left. That same day, the old man received another letter from his son. Dear Papa, go ahead and plant the tomatoes. It's the best I could do under the circumstances. <laughs> Love. Vinny. Now, you can thank or blame Carl for that. He sent that to me about four months ago, actually. I was saving it for the right moment. <laughs> to most folks in prison, the FBI and local police might not seem like allies when you need help. But for Vinny and his papa, looking outside the box, seem to get the job done. So this morning, I'd like us to think about this. Who are your allies? Do they always have to look exactly like you, and be like you, and believe like you? And who are our, our allies at the Little Home Church? And who can be our allies here at the Little Home Church? If you listen closely to the two scripture readings, you can see why our forefathers who put together the lectionary, the readings we read every week over a three-year cycle, Moses' assistant, Joshua, gets himself in a tizzy because of two rogue prophets who are prophesying in the camp. My master stopped them. And then in the gospel, John, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, says, teacher, we saw someone throwing out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. Stop the folks who are trying to do the same work that you are? Really? Moses' response was, are you jealous for my sake? If only all the Lord's people were prophets with the Lord, placing his spirit upon them. And Jesus' response was, don't stop him. No one who does powerful acts in my name can quickly turn around and curse me. Whoever isn't against us is for us. 
He flipped it. Whoever isn't against us is for us. Now, before we get into more of this, I don't want us to miss a moment here in that Old Testament lesson that Carl read today. It's where God and Moses have an argument. Yes, they argue. And I find it hilarious. And the lines so close to home. The Israelites, they're just tired of eating manna. They're tired of just bread. They want meat. And although it's not included in the lectionary readings today, FYI, this is where the, the quails come in, you know, where they start flying in every day for meat. Carl read, Moses heard the people crying throughout their clans, each at his tent's entrance. God was outraged, and Moses was upset. Great combination. Moses said to God, why have you treated your servants so badly, and why haven't I found favor in your eyes, for you have placed the burden on all of these people on me? Did I conceive these people? Did I give birth to them? Where am I to get meat for all these people? They are crying before me and saying, give us meat so we can eat. I can't bear this people on my own. They're too heavy for me. If you're going to treat me like this, please kill me. <laughs> if I found favor in your eyes, then don't let me endure this wretched situation. Not one more gall darn minute. I added that last part. <laughs> so Moses gets help. God listened. 70, el 70 elders. Strength in numbers, strength in allies. Moses didn't have to do it all. Imagine feeling so close in your relationship to God that you can be angry and use sarcasm and drama. I truly hope we can all trust God enough to have an argument now and then with the Creator Almighty. In my previous life, it was said that Beethoven shook his fist at God on his deathbed. This week's gospel passage follows immediately on last week's, continuing Jesus' train of thought about true greatness and becoming a servant of all. Remember, he asked his disciples to seek greatness not in power or prestige, but rather in serving everyone, even those lacking in social standing, such as that little child he took up in his arms. God stands with the lowest and the least, everyone left outside the boundaries that we draw. He says, go and do likewise, reach out to them. If you welcome one such child, you welcome me. And in this week's passage, Jesus extends his radical hospitality to include religious rivals. This was a time in history where there were many messiahs, actually. There were many zealots. I highly recommend a book by Riza Aslan, and it's called Zealots. And it gives you a great history of the time that Jesus lived in and the political movements that were going on. It's fascinating. There was so much competition. Mark portrays Jesus as rejecting in the strongest terms the disciples' penchant for infighting, directing them instead to focus on fixing their own failings and cultivating a posture of being at peace with one another. The disciples bless their hearts still don't get it. Jesus holding a child in his arms, he had just been teaching them about true greatness, about seeking humility, not superiority, about being a servant of all, not first of all. And how do they respond? With a breathless report showcasing their religious arrogance. 
Someone else is casting out demons in Jesus' name. And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. And note that phrase, not following us. The disciples equate following Jesus with following us. If they're not with us, they must be against us. But Jesus is a bit more open. He arrives as a healer, as a liberator. The larger mission is what matters most, and coalitions among groups with different styles and creeds will be necessary along the way. Don't stop him, he says. Even people who aren't walking with us, if they heal in my name, will be our allies in the long run. And then Jesus opens up the circle even wider, including not just those who bear the name of Christ, but also those who don't. Those who provide disciples with just the most basic assistance, like a cup of water, they too will by no means lose the reward. Jesus' emphasis always is on fruitful action, not membership or process or doing things the way that we do. In short, in the face of the disciples, if they're not with us, they're against us mentality, Jesus counters, whoever is not against us is for us. And he takes it a step further. It's as if he says, you were just arguing on the road last week about who was the greatest, and now you presume superiority over others who aren't following us. Listen to me. Quit the infighting, elitism, and arrogance. You're, settling a t you're setting a terrible example for each other, for the crowds, and especially for newer disciples, the younger ones in the faith. Stop the finger pointing and start getting your own house in order or else your hypocrisy will cause the little ones to stumble. Little ones like this child, yes, or like the stranger you mentioned, the one casting out demons in my name. For God's sake, be humble, be hospitable, set a good example. Focus on shoring up your own weaknesses, not criticizing others. Do you find yourself tempted toward worldly greatness or religious arrogance? Cut those tendencies out swiftly, completely, and don't hesitate. If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. Jesus' vivid hyperboles here underscore two things. First, that the threats don't arise from the outside. They arise from the in. It's my hand, my foot, my eye that's the source of difficulty, not the disciple walking beside me on the road, much less some other group or religion. And as far as others are concerned, my focus should be on welcoming and serving them, not judging them or forcing them to follow us. And second, Jesus hyperbole underscores the stakes here. Gehina, that's the word translated as hell in this passage, was a smoldering city dump outside Jerusalem, not some lake of fire, where trash was gathered and burned. Jesus' message is clear. In fighting elitism, arrogance, they're formidable, self-destructive dangers, and so we should continually guard against them, rooting them out if necessary with vigilance and resolve, Throw them on the trash pile. Throw them out. Don't be a hot mess. Ain't nobody want to join that movement. This is a lesson about self-discipline. And it isn't easy, but we can't avoid it. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt was a preservative in the ancient world. And it was also sometimes added to sacrifices in order to purify them. So the poetic idea here then is that by the grace of God, a disciple's trials, our trials, including the trials of self-discipline, disciples are called to serve as salt for creation and for the sake of being at peace with one another.
Just a little recap. Last week, the disciples argued over who was the greatest amongst themselves, creating some division. And this week, it's against those who don't follow us. Jesus names peace with one another as the indispensable goal and ours as well. Cut out the arrogance, cut out the divisiveness, be at peace with one another. Jesus is calling his disciples to model a genuinely peaceful way of life for the sake of the little ones, the children, and those who are younger in the faith. By peace, he means a humble, hospitable bearing toward fellow disciples and outside groups alike. Even those who don't bear the name of Christ. In today's terms, non-Christians. They are potential allies. So long as given, a person or group isn't explicitly against us, if they work toward healing, restoration of the world, or even simply assist others who are doing so, they're for us in the end. I would call it inclusive collaboration. It pertains to Christian relations with members of each other's religions and no religion at all. Jesus explicitly says that not only those who bear the name of Christ, but those who assist them in a simple way will be rewarded. In this age dominated by news of conflict, breaking news, division, polarization, this week's passage presents to us an occasion to look at being and practicing being at peace with one another. As we tackle the issues of inequality and war, climate, racism, homophobia, the list is endless. We need each other. We need allies inside and outside the walls of ourselves and the walls of the church. Last Monday night, our t -Perk team gathered with our coach, Reverend Jeffrey Phillips. For some of you, Jeffrey was, um, you may not know, Jeffrey was an interim pastor here many years ago. And we explored a topic that has been close to my heart for 20 years since being a part of this congregation. And it's called Congregational Care. And don't get me wrong, we do a pretty darn good job. But as we grow, as new folks come into our church, we need to be prepared to meet those demands. What if in these times another church has to close and folks come to us to merge their church with ours? Imagine having members of our congregation trained to assist others for visitation in homes, hospitals, families with special needs. There will be much more to come about this topic in the future. But know that if we do this, we don't do it alone. God has provided that Holy Spirit, that holy energy, to help us find allies, to be allies, and to live at peace with one another. We're always changing, and we can always make changes. Author Anne Lamott said it this way, and I quote, we can change. People say we can't, but we do when the stakes or the pain is high enough. And when we do, life can change. It offers more of itself when we agree to give up our busyness. Nothing keeps us from changing more than our tendency, our willingness to remain locked into versions of ourselves, into personae and identities barred in by heavy leaden rods of self-righteousness. Too often we'd rather be right than understand. 
understand ourselves or understand others in the world, but it is only understanding which grows by leaps and bounds through wrong guesses and failed theories that firms our grasp on the present and on reality. May it be so for you. May it be so for me. May it be so for the Little Home Church that we will be a people of peace and people will see that we live in peace with one another. Amen. At this time, we come to our pastoral prayer. And we always start, I know we have um, visitors here today, we always start with some joys and concerns. I will just lift up again Joe Sterner going through treatment for leukemia. Um, they're hopeful for a donor match, and November 1st he would um, go into some isolation uh, for several weeks to, um, to begin his treatment. And the only other thing I really have is I would like us to remember folks uh, in the southeast of our country affected by the hurricane. Anyone else? Up here, Nancy. And Nancy, welcome back. You're welcome. About a year ago, is this on? Yep. About a year ago, I asked for prayers for my niece who uh, has kidney cancer. Um, and she's undergoing chemo. So prayers that the chemo is working. And her daughter, my grandniece, Lauren, has been in the hospital for a month with complications of pregnancy and is having a, um, a cesarean tomorrow. So prayers for a healthy baby and mama and um, prayers for anyone suffering with cancer or after treatment to remain cancer free. And Nancy, what is your niece's name? My niece is Kara. Kara. My Thanks. great niece is, is Lauren. Lauren. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Andrea. Yes, um, I have some very good friends, a couple who live in Wayne, and their adult son recently lost his battle with cancer, so prayers for them. I, they're pretty private, so I'm mm -hmm. sharing their name. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Sorry, I, I was recognizing. Sorry, Judy. <laughs> um, speaking as you were a moment ago about the hurricane marching through the southeast. I learned just last night that about 24, 48 hours earlier, uh, Helene marched through my son's neighborhood. He lives in a suburb of Atlanta. And a huge tree took out completely a, a child's play set in the house next door. The tree fell inches from my son and daughter-in-law's Med bedroom. So today it's absence of concern and gratitude for good luck. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. I wanted to update everybody on uh, some concerns I brought up last week. If you remember, my mother, or not my mother, my stepmother was going into surgery for. Um, having some tumors that they weren't sure what they were. Her, her surgery was super successful. She's doing well. The, cancer, the tumors were not cancerous. They were benign, so that was good news. And then also my dad's best friend was and still is in the hospital. They suspected he had had a brain tumor. Now it's looking a little more like a cyst and his situation continues to evolve. So they're transporting him from Rockford to Chicago later this week. So continued prayers for both of them. What is your stepmom's name? Uh, Laura. And, and then Kirk. Kirk. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? All right. Let's go to God in prayer.
Good and gracious God, we ask the question, who is for us? Jesus answered, anyone who extends a helping hand, who shelters the homeless, cares for the earth, feeds the hungry, teaches the ignorant, stands for justice, gives a cup of water, they are all for us, and they belong to God. God, all we want is to belong to you. We come into your presence from many places. We come with songs of joy and shouts of gratitude. And some of us come carrying heavy burdens and sighs of suffering. As you welcome us into your house, lift our burdens and receive our prayers. Salt us with your grace and flavor us with your mercy. Bind us together that we may be at peace with one another and be strengthened to go forth in service to the world. Salt gives taste to food and it prevents spoilage. It is a healing agent. God, may we be the salt that takes away the blandness and the routine of living that prevents the rottenness of hatred and greed from expanding around us. Let us be the salt that brings compassionate healing to anguished souls that we encounter. Hear us in our silent prayers. God, we lift before you this morning Joe Sterner and his family, folks affected by the hurricane, those who are lucky like Judy's son and daughter-in-law. Be with Kara. She goes through her chemo. Be with Lauren and her baby. Be with the couple who lost their adult son. We ask you to be with Laura and Kirk and are grateful for some positive news for both of them. And we pray all of this, O oh God, knowing you are hearing us far better than we are speaking. We pray this as a community of faith in all the many and holy names of God. And in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Call to offering. This is the time in our worship services where we actively and intentionally take part in the support of the ministry of Christ. If you are a member of the Little Home Church, we encourage you to continue your pledges and financial support, and if you are visiting with us today, we welcome your gifts as well. You may donate by cash, check, Venmo, and Zelle. The QR codes for Venmo and Zelle are listed in the bulletin for your convenience. For those of you who may be watching this on YouTube later in the week, the information is in the online bulletin as well. Please join me in the offertory prayer. Creating God, thank you for hearing our prayers, receiving these gifts, and making them holy for, for your kingdom. Bless and honor every gift, enlarge our territory, and renew the resources as a demonstration of generosity and flourishing in your realm. Amen.
You may be seated. While in prison and in chains, Paul wrote the following words found in Colossians chapter 4. Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Your speech should always be gracious and sprinkled with salt and insight so that you may know how to respond to every person. Go in peace and live the church. May the God in you, the divine image to which you are made, see the God in me, and may we recognize all the allies who will cross our paths in the days that lie ahead. Amen. Thank you. 